Fast fact. In the United States, more than 72% of small businesses have fewer than 10 employees. I'm Drew Thomas, and you're listening to Bank Chats. Welcome to the next episode of Amerisur Presents Bank Chats, and today we are going to be talking about businesses. We're going to talk a little bit about how small businesses get started. We're going to talk a little bit about how your bank might be able to help you with that small business, uh, what kinds of things you should be thinking about before you decide to get into that kind of water, as far as whether you should be an entrepreneur, run your own business, that sort of thing. The Bureau of Labor and Statistics says that 20% of small businesses fail within the first year. And 30% are out of business by the end of year two, and even 70% are out by year 10. So if you see a business out there that has established in 1972, they're already outclassing 70% of the other businesses (laughs) that uh, started around that same time. So to talk with me about this, because nobody wants to hear me talk all by myself, uh, is (laughs) Tara Schaefer. She is uh, with us from Ameriserve's um, commercial commercial lending, um, as well as Mark Miller from our business services department. Uh, at Ameriserve. So um, Tara, tell, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. And Yeah, so I'm an area executive with Ameriserve Bank. I run the commercial lending team in both uh, Center and Blair counties, as well as our portfolio manager group. I've been in banking a little over 22 years, uh, really just on the commercial lending side of the house, both in credit and in lending. Uh, and that's what I do here. Awesome, awesome. And Mark, what, what, what you're you're relatively new to Ameriserve, but what do you, what are you doing for it? Yeah, I'm new to Ameriserve, uh, but I've spent 36 years in the banking industry, uh, primarily very similar to Terra. Uh, I was on the credit side and commercial lending side for a long time. Uh, for most of those years, spent 10 years on the retail side. Okay. Um, and then there was two years in there. <laughs> I kind of went away, walked away a little bit and, and spent uh, two years at a, a, as assistant director in the SBDC working with small businesses. So okay. a little bit of background there. What, well. What's the SBDC? Let's, let's small see. Business Development Centers. Okay. So, you know, talking about small businesses, I mean, it seems like entrepreneurship is on the rise. Um, I mean, you look at, at TV shows like Shark Tank that have been on ABC for 15 years. Everybody's talking about trying to start their own business. They have some product or service or something that is better than everybody else. How, how do these people get started? What, what are some of the things that, that a person who's thinking about starting a small business should be thinking about? Um, well, I think one of the things they need to be thinking about is, you know, why? Why do they want to start a small business? Because if you think that you just don't want to work for somebody else anymore, you want to be your own boss, you can be your own boss 17 plus hours a day because uh, that's how many hours you're going to be working at least in your in your small right. business. So I think you really need to understand why you want to go into a small business. Um, I think that coupled with, you know, is there demand for my product? Does it fit a need in the marketplace? How will it how will it play into what customers are looking for? I think those are two of the key aspects that you really need to think about. And then wh- who can I surround myself with? that's going to help me make this successful because Mm -hmm. no one person can do it alone. Yeah, I I would definitely agree with that. I mean, I don't have any direct experience personally with running a business, but yeah, in my family, my, my dad has owned his own business for 52 years now. And um, that was one of the things that growing up, we always kind of knew that, you know, yeah, dad can be anywhere he needs to be when he needs to be, except that when he's not at work, there's no money coming in. So there's, there are no sick days. There is no paid vacation. It's, you know, it's a little bit different Mm -hmm. uh, being your own boss for sure. Absolutely. So you mentioned, is, is there a place for my product or service? So I guess what you're saying is, you know, people should probably look to see, first of all, is my product or service already out there? And I just don't know about it. Or can I reinvent and sort of put a different spin on something? I think is, is there, there has to be some, some differentiating factor, right? Is I think what you're saying between what's already out there and what you can provide. Yeah. Are you, are you solving a problem? Are you filling a gap in the market that's not there or is that product already out there, but you can do it better? Yeah. So I think that's what you really need to make sure that there's demand mm-hmm. for your product, because if you make the best pizza in the world but you're in a community that doesn't eat carbs and doesn't want pizza, it's not going to go well. Right. Yeah. That's, that's an excellent point. And I think that 
That is a great point that you're making because on the SBDC side, and I said I spent a couple of years there, what, what we used to see is we'd see some people come in the door and they had the, uh, they had the way out idea that, you know, I've got this idea and it's the greatest in the world. Mm-hmm. And we'd really say to them, well, what are you good at? What do you, what do you, what do you, what did you do before you came here? What, what do you know? Uh, and, and what can you do better at? Mm-hmm. And I think that's what really helps somebody get that off the ground in a way. Not that crazy, not that, I won't say crazy, but that way out idea that I'm going to do something that nobody else has. But as Tara said, if I have, if I'm good at something and I can provide that service better, that's, that's more of the, that's more of the, I think, a better foundation for a start of the business. Yeah, I, I mean, I, just thinking about examples of, of something along those lines, you know, I think of things like, like Yeti cups. Uh, or, or what uh, Stanley cups now are like mm-hmm. the huge yeah. thing, They're right? Huge. Yeah, everybody yeah. wants a Stanley <laughs> cup, right? But I mean, people have been drinking out of, out of travel mugs forever. The, the, it's not that they invented something brand new. It's just that they, they did something that was already being done, but they just did it better. Absolutely. But at the same time, I don't think a lot of people realize that they didn't just appear there. There was research and development that went into that. There was engineering designs. There were patents that had to be filed. There's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that happens with entrepreneurs and businesses that before you get to the point where you're, you know, sitting on top of a pile of money. Right? <laughs> um, so starting a small business, I mean, so what comes first? Should you have uh, uh, money available to start the business on your own? Do you, do you go to a bank to get a small business loan? W- what's involved in getting a business started? Well, I, number one is the idea, you know, having the idea, having the passion. If I was starting a business today, I, I don't know, I'd probably do something along the finance side or help people with finances as opposed to, uh, I don't know doing uh, therapy on somebody, right? Or trying to be, yeah, I just wouldn't mm-hmm. do something like that. But I think, and Tara made a good point earlier, it's who you surround yourself with. And I'm going to make that pitch. There's a lot of resources out there that help you get started. And one of them is the, the SBDC. And I'm going to, I'll make my plug now for it since I'm here. <laughs> but having worked in there, you know, they, they provide uh, training, and resources to small businesses, startups, and existing businesses for expansion. Mm-hmm. And it's free. So you're not outlaying any money right off the top for, those, for that uh, service that they'll provide. And they'll do everything from business planning, which I'm sure we'll talk about in, mm-hmm. this, uh, se- in this segment. They'll do marketing research. They'll help you with at least knowing what licenses and things you have to do to get started. Mm-hmm. Maybe even help you decide what type of entity you want to be, whether you should be a sole prop versus an LLC, et cetera. So help lay that groundwork through that business plan, which is also, I think Tara will agree with this, instrumental for the bank to have too, Mm -hmm. when they're looking at at startups and expansions and just businesses in general. And that that plan, that uh, business plan is, is a working document. So most people come in and say, here's my business plan and here it is. But what happens is, is that's a working document and that can last you through one, two, five, 10, 15 years, as long as you're in business and you have to be adaptable and be willing to adapt it as time goes on. So your business plan, like you, you hear about people saying, well, I put together a business plan, but what you're, so what you're, what you're saying is your business plan, it's not something that you do once you get your funding, you start your business, then you just throw out the window. Like your business plan has to continue. You have Mm -hmm. to have a a process. Absolutely. Um, before we move forward, I want to touch on one other thing, too, just to make sure we understand acronyms. So you said either a sole prop or an LLC. What's the difference between a sole proprietorship and an LLC? Well, a, a sole proprietorship is, well, if I was just doing it myself, mm-hmm. right? Maybe I'm the only employee. I could have multiple employees, but I'm, it's me by myself, in essence. Mm-hmm. Where an LLC, I think Tara can speak maybe as well to this, is her and I could be together uh, in a business and we've, de- we've, uh, we've got a limited liability corp, which limits our liability. Okay. Mm-hmm. Moving forward on certain things, but it gives us a framework, what tax wise, et cetera. Yeah. Right? It's really something yeah. you want to work with your attorney and your, you know, tax professionals on to figure out what you're trying to accomplish and what is the best, 
you know, structure for you to start your business in because there are tax advantages to each. Mm -hmm. There is liability protection to each. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's important that you understand those things. And that's part of that getting your team together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how Mark had mentioned, the SBDC will help you with those type of things. They'll help you understand that for free. So if you can't afford, you know, I say you should use your accountant, you should use your attorney. (laughs) You might not be able to afford an attorney yet or to afford an accountant yet. So you Mm -hmm. use these free resources that are out there. And there are multiple SBDCs throughout the state. Mm -hmm. They're very frequently tied to a university. Okay. Um, So if you're trying to find an SBDC, look to your local university. That's probably a good spot to see if they have one associated with them that they can help guide you. Yeah. And And if you look at our footprint, there, there are multiple ones in there. I mean, yes. I could go and name them all, but I won't. <laughs> but there, we have one in Center County. Yep, there's one associated with at, Penn State. Mm-hmm. Cambria County here yep. with St. Francis, all the way down into Pittsburgh. Pitt has, a, has one that I always looked at back in the day. Uh, they, they call it the um, Center for Entrepreneurial Excellence. They gave it a nice fancy name. <laughs> uh, and then you have them all over the state. But each one... I, I think they've kind of morphed a little bit. So they're still going to do business planning and some training for mm-hmm. you and different things like that and some research. But you might be able to find some expertise if you're doing something internationally somewhere at, at a different, you know, at, at one that you wouldn't find maybe locally. So the best thing is, is look around and see. So they're available more than just at Pennsylvania, right? Mm-hmm. They're and available they're, across the country. And, yeah, and they're funded yeah. by the SBA. Okay. So, and the SBA is. So we'll give them a Small business we'll administration. <laughs> yeah. Bankers like their Sorry, acronyms. Sorry, we love yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, the, there's a lot of industries that use acronyms, but banking yeah. is a big one. Absolutely. So you mentioned about not being able to necessarily afford a, a lawyer right out of the gate or an accountant right out of the gate. Where does the money or, or funding come from to start a business? I mean, do you sort of have to have that funding ahead of time? Do you go to a bank and say, hey, here's my business plan. I want to get a small business loan. Where, 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 do you, where do you start there? Yeah, so, you know, getting a small business loan, banks are really going to be looking for some established track record. We're going to want to see some proof of concept, some, some kind of grass under your feet, that you've got things in motion, that you've got a year or two behind you before we're going to be looking to put a bank loan in place to fund something. So a lot of small businesses mm-hmm. are really funded um, by owner savings. Uh, we call it the friends and family package, uh, where you, you know, you go out and get investors from your, your friends and family network who invest in your company. Um, a lot of people will leverage their own assets. They'll take out a home equity line of credit or they'll mortgage their house where maybe they had it free and clear previously, mm-hmm. or take out more debt in those spaces to help fund those initial startup phases before they're revenue generating. Okay. So in that case, though, you, you also have to consider that if your business does not get off the ground, you know, that that's a risk that you're sort of putting on yourself that, OK, I'm mortgaging my house or I'm taking out another loan. That loan has to be paid back somehow. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, so if the business is established, as you said, if it has two or three years under it, say, and it, and it seems to be it seems to be self-sustaining, you know, at that mm-hmm. point and you do get a loan, w- what happens if the business goes under. Does the bank then say, well, I'll take what I can get, or do you still owe that money back even, even without the business being in, in, in business? I mean, you're still gonna, you're still gonna owe the money back that you borrowed. That's, you know, that kind of comes back to Mm -hmm. my initial concept of why are you getting in this to begin with? Because it's a, it's a long road. It's a long haul. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of hours and it's a lot of risk. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, I mean, you still do, if, if the business goes under, you're still responsible to help pay for those debts that you took out. Yeah. I mean, just from your experience and without naming any names, I mean, do you have any, any sort of stories that maybe either you tried to warn somebody off on something, or maybe somebody didn't quite understand that before they got involved in, in doing a a business of their own? You know, I, I talk with a lot of startup businesses because I, I love the, I love the space. I love to work with people who are trying to figure out how to make it work Mm. and how to learn in those spaces. And I've had, I've had a lot of interesting questions over the years. I don't know if it's exactly where you were going with, with that, but I, you know, I had one person ask me one day, well, do I put my, I'm building a budget. Do I put my salary in that budget? Mm. And I said, okay, good question. Are you going to pay yourself a salary? Well, I'm not doing this for free. 
And I went, <laughs> well, then it needs to go in the budget. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so it's just, you know, some people are just really trying to figure out where to start from and, and how to make this work. And, and I very frequently tell my customers from talking to you, you are thinking like, an entrepreneur, or you are thinking on the conservative side, or you're thinking, you know, you're thinking about your craft. I don't see you thinking about the financial piece of it, or Mm -hmm. I'll see someone that knows the financial piece inside Mm -hmm. and out, but they don't really have the craft part of the business. And that's when I say, you know, if you're a fantastic pottery maker, but you can't build a budget to save your life, you need to find a partner. Mm -hmm. You need to find that other piece. Very few people that I've ever met in my 20 plus years are great at both. It's a matter of putting the right people around you, whether it's a partner, whether Mm -hmm. it's an advisor, whether, you know, it's one of your accountants or someone else, but don't, don't try to go it alone because you need all of those pieces to make it work. I think that that's probably a good point. It's probably the reason why so many businesses fail so quickly uh, is that, you know, you might have a fantastic idea, but if you can't implement it in a way that is financially stable to be able to keep yourself in business, you're you're just not going to be able to make a go of it. Um, I guess, I guess that kind of leads into my, my next question, which was sort of the idea of if the business doesn't succeed, is it, does the bank sort of, Okay, I'll use this example. If 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 you mortgage your house, right? B- banks are not in the business of wanting to sell your house. They don't want to take over your house. They don't want that on their books. They don't want to have to resell it. You know, that's not the bank's goal, right? But ultimately, your house is your collateral, right? If if for whatever reason you can't make your mortgage payments and there's no way to work out a, 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 a an alternative payment plan or whatever it is that your bank would most likely work with you on first, ultimately the bank could then use the home as, as a repayment for the loan, right? The asset of the house. Yeah. It was so, just as collateral. Absolutely. So is the business, like a lot of businesses rent space. So there is no building that they own. Mm-hmm. A lot of businesses are service based. So maybe there is no product overhead to handle. So how does a person protect themselves uh, personally f- and their personal assets from, how do they keep them separate from the business? I guess is my question. And that's, I think that's the really hard part because like you said, you're renting a space. You don't have a building as collateral. If you're, you know, you don't have a whole lot of equipment. You know, if you're a restaurant, liquidating tables and chairs from a collateral (laughs) perspective isn't getting you a whole lot. Right. I was going to say, yeah, very little on the dollar there with a restaurant. So Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, the concept of protecting yourself personally with the concept of starting a business doesn't really vibe together. Mm-hmm. You're mm. you're kind of all in. You don't you're, really get to the point where you can really start to protect yourself until the business is already standing on its own mm-hmm. to begin with. Because if we're doing a loan for the business, we're going to want you as a personal guarantor on the loan, or right. in some cases, a co-borrower, mm-hmm. depending on the structure of the loan. Mm-hmm. And I've done that throughout with different businesses. And yeah, you're all in on this. So I mean, you have to you have to ask that question. I go back a little bit as to how much risk are you willing to deal with? Mm-hmm. Some people are risk averse, and they're like, "Well, I really don't want to do that." That's why I probably never started a business. Mm-hmm. But I think those who are are good with risk, can, they can they can I won't say survive, but they can at least get off the ground, right? And they understand what those risks are when they get into it, mm-hmm. and they have to be all in. And a lot of times they have to be, able, they have to be comfortable with signing the front of the check instead of the back of the check. <laughs> that's, that's a good, so, yeah. Right. Yeah. Because people, we get our checks and it goes back to the eighties when I first started. Sorry. But you know, people <laughs> will sign the back of them. Okay. I'm getting paid now. You're, you might not get paid. Mm-hmm. It goes back to, you know, whether I'm putting my salary or not that first year or two, you might not take that salary. Mm -hmm. Right. You might or might not. So you have to be willing to take what you're making and write that check back in and reinvest it and continue to grow. So if if you're not willing to do those type of things on top of just under also understanding that, that you have to be comfortable with public failure too. That's, that's probably a good point. Yeah. Absolutely. If I start a business, I go down the street and I don't make it. Everybody knows I don't make it. Right. So if, you know, I mean, I'll use this example, you know, mm-hmm. 
if 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 you don't if you decide not to go to law school, uh, well, you know, you just say to somebody, well, "I just decided not to go to law school." I.e., I plunked the LSATs, um, <laughs> or I want to spend more time with my family. Uh, I got left go. But when you fail in the business, you are the business, and when you fail, you have to be comfortable with those couple things. I think. Yeah. As a business owner, or at least yeah. on the risk side. You know, I'm, I got to be willing to be all in on this and it might go south and I could be on the hook and I have to be willing to do that if I want to take that step. Yeah, and I, th- I think this is, um, this is the, the conversation we've had so far really seems to, I, I don't want it to sound like a Debbie Downer that you can't, <laughs> right. like you can never do this. Don't even try. That's yeah. not what this is about. But I think really what we're, what we're learning so far here is that uh, there's a lot of people that want to spend time focusing on the successes of, of entrepreneurs. And there's a lot of people that want to point to the, the, the Elon Musk's of the world. They want to point to the, 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 uh, the, the people that have, that have made something out of nothing and they want to be that right. And there's nothing wrong with having that kind of a dream, but you have to also understand that there was a lot of work that went in behind the scenes and a lot of, uh, a lot of struggle and a lot of failure uh, mm-hmm. that, that may have come along with that before they reached that pinnacle. And you have to, to, to your point, Mark, you have to be, to be willing to accept that. Well, and I think it's important to know and to think about that 64% of American jobs are small businesses. Mm-hmm. This is such, oh. such an important segment. Um, and it's important that we do everything we can as a society to protect this segment and help them grow and help them reach mm-hmm. the next step. And I think going into the experience with your eyes wide open as to what to expect is, is really the first step in helping them figure out how to make it. Because you don't yeah. get a big business unless you started with a small one. So I'll just preface this by saying the restaurant is still going strong. I can remember being at the SBDC and a young man walked in one day and, and uh, he wanted to start a restaurant. And he came in and he knew everything about how to run a restaurant. I mean, he had done it. He managed them. He just never owned his own, Mm -hmm. but he wasn't as good on the finance part. And so we did at the SBDC, we did every, you know, all the legwork for him, put the business plan together, put the numbers together. And he wanted to go to his bank. I wasn't so sure that was going to work, but he went to the bank and they did a loan for him. They did it because going back to what you said, Tara, his, his father, very well-known and established, went in there and became a co-borrower with him and went in on this with him. Mm-hmm. And through the years, they, and somebody could probably figure out who it might be, I don't know, but they, they've survived two fires. They have continued to rebuild mm-hmm. and reinvent, and they're still there today. And it was all because, you know, again, Going back to a success story, it can happen, mm-hmm. and it does happen, and it's in our best interest for it to happen because he's employed a lot of people over the years there, and uh, I've eaten there many times, and it's just you know I just think it's a it, it's a good story, and and we and they can succeed. It's not all like you said, it's not all Debbie Down, right? Yeah, eighty um, percent of them do make it, right? According to the statistic, yeah. <laughs> in the first year. You said you said that um, sixty four percent of of businesses in the United States are, are small businesses. Sixty four percent of the the new jobs are created by small businesses. Okay, so so that that is a, a very uh, important statistic too. I think. I mean, we we talk about in November they always have you know Small Business Saturday, right? Which is like the Saturday right after Black Friday, and um, you know it seems like sometimes that's the 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 only time that that there's a lot of public recognition of the fact that small businesses really keep the the country moving in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Your local hardware store, your local bookstore, your local coffee shop, uh, whatever it might be, where you go to have lunch every day. Th- those are the kinds of places that that are sort of salt of the earth type businesses that uh, maybe don't get the recognition publicly or 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 across the nation, but. If if you took sixty four percent of our small businesses away, what, or, or, what what would you have left? Yeah, and those mm-hmm. that they, they contribute to forty four percent of our U.S. economy economic activity, according to the SBA. I mean, wow. they're they're yeah. super crucial. Wow. So I wanted to touch a little bit on on business plan too. What goes into a business plan? Like, what do you need to have in there other than a budget, for example? Well, you're you're starting off with. 
parts of it would be your management structure. So as we said before, maybe at that point you've decided that you are just going to be a sole prop or you are, maybe you do want to do an LLC or a single owner LLC or whatever that might be. And so that will be laid out in there, not entirely, but it, w- it will be laid out. You know, the name of your business, right? You have to have a name and you have to file fictitious names and different things like that. So that's in there. Um, organizational structure. So if you're having multiple employees or um, however that's going to be, you know, maybe Tara and I are partners or somebody else is working. I've got two other people working for me. So that whole management structure layout Maybe you're located. There's, there's a lot of background information. I've even seen it to the point where there's background information on the owner himself, which oh, is absolutely. extremely, extremely important mm-hmm. uh, for everyone right, involved because we, we have to know that this person is, lack of a better term, qualified or knowledgeable and right, what, what they're going to do going forward, right? Mm-hmm. So that's in there. And then at the end of the day, I think, you can have your own separate marketing plan, but there's probably going to be a little bit of a marketing plan in there mm-hmm. uh, to help kind of whether it's going to be social media or whatever that's going to be to start out. And you're probably going to be on a shoestring budget there anyway. But you, you still have to have a marketing plan. And that can be included in that. And again, the most important thing are, is it going to be your numbers, right? What those projections are going to look like. And, and they have to be realistic. I've gone through... <laughs> as a credit guy and a lender, I've I've gone through those and you see things that, you know, sometimes just don't make sense or aren't realistic. So the more realistic, the numbers and more realistic, the projections, the better. So like I said, and it's a working document because your marketing plans can change. Employees might change over time. You might increase, right? You might uh, expand your market. I mean, maybe right now you're just focusing on Johnstown or, State college or whatever, but then it might be, hey, I can, you know, I'm I'm marketing to all of Western Pennsylvania or, or Central Pennsylvania, so mm-hmm. that all goes into that business plan, and it's a start, it's a foundation, but again, it's a working document that should stay with you. Too many people just take it and then, okay, I got it and put it away, but mm-hmm. it should be evolving as you evolve. So. Yeah, absolutely, and I like to see some industry analysis in there, who your comp, who your competitors are. Mm, um, that's a good point. you know, I like to see a lot of that stuff in, in the business plans as well. And then I also challenge, you know, the entrepreneurs that I do work with to kind of go back and keep looking at that initial business plan as you update it and, and remember why you got started. Remember mm-hmm. how this started. Doesn't mean that that's how the way you still have to do it, <laughs> but remember why you got started and what's gotten you to where you're at now, because that kind of can help guide where you're going from here. Okay. So assuming that, um, you know, let's start looking at this from a more positive perspective, assuming that I've got my business off the ground, I'm, I'm Mm -hmm. relatively successful. I'm, I'm making ends meet. I'm making a profit. I'm doing all those kinds of things. And then for example, in my business plan, it says, okay, well, uh, between the years six and eight, my plan is to expand, to add a second location, to find a new market, whatever that might be. Um, and in order to do that at this point, I kind of need a loan or something like that. Um, When you go to your bank, is it similar to getting a mortgage or is it a little bit of a different process? How do you go about getting a business loan at that point? Yeah. So business loans are definitely different than consumer loans. Um, And I think a lot of people get confused about that. Like, especially if they're going to buy their first building, they're like, okay, we're ready to be done renting. We're going to buy our first location. And they, they come to the bank and they are looking for a 30 year fixed rate loan for their, their business building that they're going to buy. That's how you do residential lending. That is not (laughs) how you do business lending. So business lending is going to be definitely different. You're looking at, you know, probably a max of a 25 year amortization, not a 30 year. Um, And you're also looking at probably a max of a five year fixed rate. Mm -hmm. And then that rate's going to reset after five years and you're going to renegotiate the loan and and start over. Um, You know, mortgages Mm -hmm. typically you can pay whatever you want over and above on a mortgage. That's not always the case. Sometimes there's prepayment penalties in commercial loans and, mm. and they're all structured a little bit differently based on your needs. Um, but there's, they're very, very different than what people are used to from a consumer lending perspective. And that's usually an eye opener yeah. for entrepreneurs. I'm curious what a pre why would there be a prepayment penalty? Like what, what did, uh, why is that in there? Yeah. So when, when a commercial business funds your loan, 
We know what margin we're making, what profit we're making on lending that money to you. And we often on the backside from what a bank does, we'll go and invest or have funds that will fund your loan and we protect our margin on that side. So how interest rates are moving, Mm -hmm. you paying that loan off could be detrimental to the bank from a protecting our margin piece. So that's really why banks should be doing it. Some (laughs) banks use prepayment penalties as handcuffs. Mm. They don't want you going somewhere else. They put a lot of work up front in to getting your loan on the books and putting everything in place. So they Mm -hmm. put a prepayment penalty in if you're going to refinance your loan at another bank. A lot, a lot of banks treat prepayment penalties that way. Yeah. Um, I, I like them more from a protecting our margin perspective, just like you would as a business, you want to protect your margins. Sure. Yeah. And I, I think it's important to, to maybe sometimes understand the logic behind why a bank does certain things, right? Because, you know, from, from an entrepreneur's perspective or even from a personal perspective, Sometimes your bank does something and you think to yourself, why would they do it? They're just trying to, just, yeah. and that's not really the case. It's, it's really, there, there is a logic, there is a process, there's a purpose to what they're doing. And um, maybe sometimes that isn't explained as well as, as it might be uh, Absolutely. to understand both sides of the, of the coin. Yeah. Like a lot of banks, um, you'll see banks charging unused fees on a line of credit. And <clears> someone's <throat> like, well, why are you charging me when I'm not, I'm not using your funds? Well, if we've given you a million dollar line of credit, we have to reserve capital for that line of credit. We have costs to keeping that line of credit open. If we're not using it, if you're not using it, mm-hmm. we're not making any interest on it. So I, I explained to my customers, you know, you own this strip plaza and your tenant says, I want to rent unit A. And I'm pretty sure at some point I'm going to rent unit B. So don't rent that to anybody else. Just leave that one open in case I need it in the future. Mm-hmm. Well, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I'm losing money if I can't rent unit B to somebody else. <laughs> right. how, how is this, you know, and then they start to understand those concepts of why banks are doing the things that we're doing. Banks aren't nonprofits, you know, Yeah. the majority, right. yeah. I should say the I mean, majority, you know, yeah, the majority, credit yeah. unions and that kind of stuff. Yes. But, you know, banks are for profit entities. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of people don't, they don't think about that piece of it. And even if you're not necessarily a for-profit entity, you still have to cover your expenses. Right. Absolutely. Right. You have employees, you have things that, you know, you have overhead, you have buildings. So even if you're not necessarily in it for profit, you still have to cover your expenses. Mm-hmm. Right? There, there and, is a cost to yeah. doing business. Sure. And I think sometimes that uh, from a banking perspective, we, we deal with a lot of intangible things. Uh, we don't, you can't walk in and take a box off the shelf and say, this is my loan, right? It's this sort of like <laughs> right. ethereal thing that you, you, you have papers and stuff, but, but putting it in the perspective of, of, okay, you have a strip mall and you can't rent half of your spaces just in the event that I might want to do something with them someday, I think puts it in a good sort of tangible, realistic way to, yeah. to, to yeah. helping understand that. W- what kinds of things can your bank do to help you run your business? Are there uh, beyond a loan? I should say, are there certain uh, products, services, things like that, that your bank might be able to help you do? I'm thinking along the lines of things like, like remote deposit capture mm-hmm. or uh, budgeting, that sort of thing. And you've, you've started off pretty well there. With yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, online banking, mm-hmm. uh, remote deposit capture, right? That, that should be something that every business has, regardless of what your size is, because you want to be able to, view your balances and and view your activity daily. So those are things that help you on a daily basis and, and, and it helps you get your money in there. Look, what we're trying to do on the business services side is we're trying to help companies manage those things, manage their day to day and become efficient through managing their receivables and payables, protecting them against fraud. There are protections out there because fraud is prevalent. And at the end of the day, optimizing their cash flow. Mm -hmm. That is hugely important, I think, to the business side, because as we've been talking here, you know, it's sometimes not easy to get that loan or get that funding. And someday, the, sometimes the best way to fund yourself is to optimize and utilize your internal funding, as I like to call it, or your cash flow. Mm-hmm. And we, we here at Ameriserve, or most banks, will be able to uh, put products in, in place for them to be able to do that. So mm-hmm. whether it's online banking, mobile deposit capture, uh, ACH services, right? Not only for debiting payments, but crediting, okay, paying bills. Mm-hmm. And then also paying your employees, if you do have employees, right? Making life a little bit easier and a little bit more efficient. 
wire transfers, something that people don't, don't think about. Sometimes you have to make a larger payment than normal. How do I get that money to that supplier? How do I get to where it needs to be? And you can do them online. So if you have online banking <laughs> with a pre-authorization and an agreement, you can utilize and do it online. So if you can't get to the bank, right, it's snowing real bad and I got to get this out, but I can't get there. Oh, I have it online. I can do it. Making life a little bit easier. But it's managing those aspects, the liquidity, uh, the fraud, the cash flow. Those are the things that we can help them with on a daily basis with these products mm -hmm. and services. And I'll go back to fraud, which... That's huge. Absolutely. You're yeah, I mean, it a lot. Yeah. And businesses are not... Uh, averse to it at all. I mean, it, it's happening to everybody. We have we have such things as check positive pay and ACH positive pay. We also have debit block filters that can help them limit their exposure uh, to fraud. And it's something I was uh, talking not too long ago to a group of small businesses here in the <laughs> area. And I mentioned to them that regardless of what size you are, you should take advantage of that, protecting yourself against fraud doesn't matter if you're a large business or a small business. Mm -hmm. They said, is there a cost to it? Well, there is a cost to it. Unfortunately, there is. But would you rather lose ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 plus or something like that, you know, in a fraudulent activity or protect yourself paying X number of dollars a month for the, for the product or the ability to control that side of it? So. Yeah. And like, like Mark said, with like the positive pay and some of the different things we can do like that, you know, I tell my customers it's fire insurance before you've had the fire after everybody's had fraud and they've gone through it. They all have positive pay. Now yeah. they all have those things in place yeah. because they realize what a nightmare that was to just go through. And I said, get the fire insurance before you have a fire, mm -hmm. not after. Yeah. Well, explain what positive pay is. I mean, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's a, an industry term that you could find anywhere or if it's just what, our, what, what Ameriserve's term is, but well, explain what positive pretty, pay is. It's pretty much an industry term, uh, but it's basically on the check side. Uh, you're, you're putting in a check register every time you're writing checks. So there's numbers of checks and amounts and different things that you're, you're uh, giving, you know, you're providing the bank. And then as checks come through, to keep it very simple, uh, if something is not on that register that you've submitted, then you're going to get a notification. So, hey, Drew, here's check number, here it is, is, and you have the chance to either pay it or decline it or deny it based on what you see there by a certain time every day. And it's well worth doing that every day because, as Tara said, we've seen fires happen and then people want to put out the fire after it's occurred. And then they've lost something and then we put it in place for them going forward. But in the case of positive pay, that, uh, the check positive pay, that, that's one there that you can control mm -hmm. on a daily basis. Same way with ACH too. Uh, you know, you can submit who's going out there, what, what money's going out there. You're, you're paying electronically. Right. Yeah. And then there's a list. And then if something comes in there that's not on that list, you're going to get a notification. And you're going to have the ability, again, in that instance, to approve or decline that transaction. Yeah, because like the types of fraud that we're seeing with checks are, are people taking a check and duplicating it yeah. and then changing the mm. payee. Or they duplicate mm -hmm. it and they change the dollar amount. So if everything on the check that's being presented to the bank doesn't match the list that you gave us that said that what that check should say, that's when we say, whoa, 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 wait flag. a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And we kind of, you know, we stop the process. Yeah. That makes, oh, well, that makes sense too, because a lot of banks will charge for even stop payments. Right. So it, it's whether you're being charged for positive pay or charged for a stop payment or, or being hung out to dry because you experienced fraud and now your, your, your account is down, as you said, 10, $15,000 mm -hmm. at a, out of a payroll account or something like that. Um, you're paying somehow, <laughs> yep. you, you know, and I think yeah. I, I agree. I would rather pay a few dollars a month for a service that allowed me to be proactive rather than reactive, yeah. I and guess is what it comes down to. And as a small business, you're working so hard every day, right? Putting yeah. in that time and that effort and then to have, no ability to control that side of it, that fraud side of it. I think every business should need to, to look at that and take advantage of that mm -hmm. uh, because you don't want to absorb some loss on that side. It's just me.
It's no, I agree with you. And, and honestly, I think of, it's funny because there's a, there's an adage time is money, right? And everybody knows that adage, but nobody seems to apply it very well uh, at times to, to a business. You think about, well, I'm going to buy this uh, piece of piece of equipment, right? And the piece of equipment is $5,000, but they have a better version of that piece of equipment that's $7,500. And it does three of the things that I'm going to have to do manually with, uh, with, with machine number one, it does automatically. Um, my time is worth money, right? So if I have to, uh, yeah, I, I could save $2,500 buying the piece of equipment that, that I have to do three manual things with, right? But if I'm doing those manual things, that means I'm not devoting my time to something else that could be making me more mm-hmm. money. Right. So, and the, and it kind of comes down to the same thing with your banking. You know, if you can use online banking, if you can head things off at the pass and do things proactively, get a notification on your phone mm-hmm. that says, do you want to pay this uh, bill? Do you want to pay this check or whatever without having to always take the time to run to a, your local branch and do things like that. That's time you could be investing in your business right. uh, that you're not spending driving to the bank every day. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, it, and if you have, you know, oh, well, my assistant does that for me every day. She runs over lunch and, and takes the takes the deposits to the bank every day. Well, you know, if she's in an accident on the way to the bank, that's your insurance right. mm-hmm. as the business owner. She's doing business <laughs> yeah. work yeah. Yeah. over that. You know, it's just some things that people mm-hmm. don't even think about. Yeah. And, and, and payroll. People sweat over doing payroll all the time, right? So I know we have two methods of it. You know, we have the ACH side, the online side, where you do a template mm-hmm. or create a template and have all your information in there. And it's, a, it's just saving you more time because you're, you're not writing a check. You're not logging it in. You're mm-hmm. putting it in this template. You're making sure that the right amounts are in there. It's already been tested and sent out. It's direct deposit. You're hitting a button. It's gone. Okay. And then we have another third party that we work with here, mm-hmm. right? And a lot of places have this, that they do everything soup to nuts, okay, with regards to payroll and, and delivering payroll, even some HR functions, some things that maybe you just get too tied up on. And so that's another added service that we provide on our side of the business services side that help them run more efficiently in their day-to-day. And as you both, both you and Tara said, you know, you get uh, tied up in certain things and then you can't turn your attention to other things that matter yeah. as well. So if we can help that ba- that uh, business run more efficiently than we're doing our job. Mm-hmm. Got it. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Mark, I think you started talking a little bit about this a, a little bit ago mm-hmm. about fictitious names and things like that. So, what do you need to do? Uh, what does your bank need to know to be able to open up an, an account in the name of the business rather than in your name? Yeah. Well, I mean, first you you have to uh, you know register your business with the state. So you have to have a uh, state registration, a fictitious name should be filed. So if it's uh, um, Mark Miller doing business as Bridge City, I'm looking at a picture there and just making up, <laughs> <laughs> making up Bridge City Solutions, making up a name there. Um, I have to register that fictitious name with the state, mm-hmm. right? So nobody else has that name. So it's my name, right? So uh, you have to have that. You, if you're an LLC, uh, you're going to need an operating agreement. Uh, you're going to need other various licenses, depending on what type of business you are to open that account. Mm-hmm. And, of course, we're going to need your IDs as well and anybody else associated as a signer on that account. So depending on – now, sole proprietorships are a little bit different in a way as far as accounts go, but – I still suggest that, you, you know, I'm not putting it into my personal account. I should have a separate account for the sole proprietorship. Although I do see people that tr- try to. Yeah, your accountant will in. thank you yeah. for having a yeah. separate account. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, they should be, they should be having separate accounts. Okay. And it's really important when you have multiple people who will be signers on the account that when you do those, mm-hmm. you know, operating agreements or bylaws that you're specifically listing out okay, who has authorization to open accounts for the business? Who can close accounts for the business? Who can sign on behalf of the business? Um, Sometimes I see people put those documents together and they don't address those things at all. And those are things that the bank, you set the rules for, as the entrepreneur, you set the rules for your business. It's our job as the bank to follow them. 
Yeah, that's that's a really good point. Um, you know, you don't want somebody just coming in off the street and saying, "Yeah, I can take money out of." It. You have to tell the bank ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, who's allowed to access that account, who's not. Just like if it was your personal account, you know, nobody can just come in and take money out of my account yeah. theoretically. And that has to be set up that way. And being on the retail side, we take that we take that very seriously, extremely mm-hmm. seriously. Right. And some people will make their, making sure who we can talk to. Yeah, they'll make their rules can. really restrictive. And I'm like, that's mm-hmm. fine. Mm-hmm. And then when someone else calls in and wants information, you know, I I can't give it to you. You have to go. Well, what do you mean I have to? I'm like, I'm following right. your rules. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The the, you, you guys are the ones that set it up this way. So, you know, and that's fine. However, someone wants to set it up, we're happy to work within those rules, but we're going to follow whatever they ask for. And that's probably another one of those situations where if you've, if you've got people around you helping you do that, whether it's your lawyer, your accountant, whatever, make sure you're talking to them, make sure the communication within your business is good so that you understand what, uh, how your accounts are being set up and you know, what you're doing. So you've both worked with uh, business owners for many, many years and just, as a way of sort of trying to wrap all of this up into a nice bow, um, based on the business owners you know, the people you've worked with, um, have you have you ever gotten any pieces of advice from those business owners uh, that might benefit a, a person who's thinking about starting a business? You know, knowing uh, what, what things that they wish they would have known when they started. You know, I, I talked to a few of my entrepreneurs, um, business, people who have established multiple businesses before I came here, you know, kind of as part of my background prep work. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, some of the advice that they gave me, I said, you know, what did what would you wish someone had told you? And, you know, they said, have a good budget in play. Make sure that you know what your costs are going to be and then add some more on because it's going to be higher than you think. It, it's mm. like every project you come into, even if you're working on a project at your house, it always ends up being more expensive than you expected. Something always comes up. Ain't that the truth. Um, that was one of the pieces of advice. And then the other one uh, from the other individual said, it's, it's who you surround yourself with. I mean, he really pounded that concept home of surrounding yourself with the right people that are going to help push you forward and help give you good advice and tell you the hard things that you might not want to hear, but you know, you need to hear. Mm -hmm. Um, So making sure that you build that network around you is really going to help make sure that your business succeeds. And and I think, you know, just perseverance is a big thing because you're going to go through some ups and downs in, in your business life. I'm going to use a quick story here. So um, I was thinking about this the other day in preparation for all this, actually a couple of weeks here in preparation of this, <laughs> but um, my brother-in-laws have owned a business and they've been in business for over 40 years and it's changed <laughs> over <laughs> these years. And it, 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 they started out with, um, you know, one singular product being sold to one segment and they were selling to home builders and you know, contractors, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And through the years, they have more. It's always been with wood. <laughs> it's always been <laughs> wood related. But through the years, they have done everything from making chairs, tables. I have a few in my house. They have done different things. They, they just even just, manu- not even manufactured, but just um, resurfaced the wood. Mm-hmm. right? Uh, a contractor would bring them wood and, and it was rough wood and they would just plane it down and fix it, and get it all dried up and out it would go back out to them so they could do, the contractor would do what they could do. And um, the big thing for them has been perseverance and adaptability over the years. And the one thing they did that Tara keeps ringing in my ears here is surrounding themselves with good people. Okay, they got themselves a good accountant, got themselves a bank that they've been working with for years and years that knows them now. And through this, they've just continued to work and I don't see them quitting anytime soon. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, they had lost their jobs after the flood and ended up, you know, going into business for themselves, controlling their futures. And they've gone this far with it. And I, I just think, you know, adaptability, perseverance, surrounding yourself with good people. It's all great advice. I think, I think surrounding yourself with good people to include your bank. Yeah. Uh, you know Absolutely. what I mean? Right. I mean, it really does. I mean, you, you have to have a bank that you feel like you can work with a person 
ideally at your bank that you feel like you can work with, mm -hmm. because that's going to be an ongoing relationship too. Uh, even if you're only, you think you're going in for a small business loan, or you think you're going in to just open a checking account, that ongoing relationship that you have with your bank is going to be important too, because being able to call somebody up and say, Hey, I'm having a down year. Or I'm having this, or I'm having trouble with that. And having someone who knows you that can then talk you through, okay, well, here are your options. Here's what we can do to help. Here's how we can try to, to, to maybe, uh, take some of the pressure off short term and, and then come and revisit it again as you get back on your feet. That sort of thing uh, makes a big difference. Um, well, thank you both very much for your time. I really, really appreciate you coming down. And I know, Terry, you you made a, a trek in, <laughs> in, the <ice. laughs> um, in the ice, you know, and so forth. Um, Mark, you're here every day. So <laughs> I, I got lost coming from the fourth floor to the second floor. So I haven't been here that long. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very no, much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. This podcast focuses on having valuable conversations on various topics related to banking and financial health. The podcast is grounded in having open conversations with professionals and experts with the goal of helping to take some of the mystery out of financial and related topics, as learning about financial products and services can help you make more informed financial decisions. Please keep in mind that the information contained within this podcast and any resources available for download from our website or other resources relating to bank chats is not intended and should not be understood or interpreted to be financial advice. The host, guests, and production staff of Bank Chats expressly recommend that you seek advice from a trusted financial professional before making financial decisions. The host of Bank Chats is not an attorney, accountant, or financial advisor, and the program is simply intended as one source of information. The podcast is not a substitute for a financial professional who is aware of the facts and circumstances of your individual situation. Our appreciation to Tara Schaefer and Mark Miller from Ameriserve for joining us on the podcast today. Opening a small business can be both incredibly rewarding and incredibly demanding. Often being your own boss means also being your own inventory manager, bookkeeper, or janitor. Success comes with long hours and difficult challenges. But we want to reiterate that being a small business is no small thing. The 64% of U.S. workers whose jobs depend upon small businesses produce 44% of the U.S. economy. So if you're interested in opening one, meet the challenge by surrounding yourself with good people. Find your niche and work hard. If you haven't followed or subscribed to the podcast, we'd really appreciate it if you would. It helps a lot. Ameriser Presents Bank Chats is produced and distributed by Ameriser Financial Incorporated. Music by Rattlesnake, Milo, and Andrew Kilitkin. Production and distribution by Jeffrey Midhavish. Episodes can be found on your favorite podcast service or by visiting ameriserve.com slash bankchats. For now, I'm Drew Thomas. So long.